Well, if you would today, if you brought your Bible, open with me to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18, you might have your Bible on your, on your phone or on another device, but if you have it, and we always encourage you to bring your Bibles to follow along, we'll put the verses up on the screen, but we're going to study through Exodus 13, we're going to start reading verses 13 through 27 in just a few moments, and then we'll bounce back and, and look at some truths in the beginning of the chapter. So, so there, are, there are certain things in life that are better shared than doing alone, right? Do you agree with me on that? There's certain things in life that are much better shared. Vicki and I uh, kind of walked through a list this week of things that are better shared. We thought, man, it's, it's better to share the holidays than to spend them alone. Is that not true? Uh, who wants to eat turkey all by yourself? Or if you come from a Hispanic background, who wants to eat lechon all by yourself, right? Uh, it, it, it's so much better to share that with someone else. A conversation. A conversation is a, is a two-way interchange of thoughts. We generally don't have conversations with ourselves, right? If you're having a lot of conversation with yourself, come and talk to us afterward, and we have some doctors that we would like to guide you to. There has to be what? Two people at least for a conversation. It's something that is shared. I thought household chores. Moms, you'll like that, right? Household chores aren't the responsibility of one person, but they're better what? When they're shared, when everybody does it together. A good meal. If you go out to a restaurant, you don't want to sit there all by yourself. You want to be able to share that experience with someone else. I also wrote ice cream. There's just something about ice cream that, that draws people together, is it not? You have a bowl of ice cream, you want to share that with somebody else. And then I got to thinking, unless there's only one scoop left. If there's only one scoop left, then it's every man, it's every woman for himself or herself. Well, like a stimulating conversation, or like a good meal, or a delicious bowl of ice cream, ministry is meant to be shared. Let me say that again. Ministry is meant to be shared. That, that truth is illustrated in Exodus chapter 18, where we're studying today. So if you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 18, we're going to read just a little bit of a lengthy passage of Scripture, and so follow along. Exodus 18, beginning in verse 13, and we'll read through the end of the chapter, and we'll put this in context in just a second. Those of you who, have, who are here every week, you know, we're walking through the book of Exodus, and so you understand the foundation of everything that is taking place. Exodus 18, 13. So the next day… Moses sat to judge the people. So remember, they have, uh, they have escaped from Egypt. They have crossed the Red Sea. They're now in the Sinai Peninsula, and they are, they are at least moving towards the promised land. And so this large group of people are traveling together, and Moses would sit and judge them. Verse 14, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people have come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know these are the statutes of God and his law. Verse 17, Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. Now, now remember, what was Moses doing? He was ministering. He was taking the truth of God's law, God's word, applying it to the lives of individual people. And yet Jethro said, what you are doing is not good. You and the people will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing that you are doing is too heavy for you. It's too burdensome, the idea of the word for you. You cannot do it alone. Jethro says, now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God, and yes, you shall bring their cases to God, and yes, you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. But, moreover, look for able men 
from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. And let them, along with you, judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people will go to their place in peace. Verse 24, Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And the rest of the chapter just states how he took them and divided them up into different groups and he placed men over them, sharing the burden of ministry. Here's what Moses is showing us in this passage. Ministry is not to be done by one person or a small select group of people. Ministry is intended to be shared. God desires for all of us to be ministers. Let's think about that truth today. Would you pray with me? Father, as we approach your word today, how we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would be our teacher. Help us to understand the truths that he would have us to learn from this passage. Father, help us to realize that you desire that we not be mere spectators. I'm afraid to a certain degree we've, we've established an erroneous paradigm of church where we come in and we sit and we listen and we fail to realize that there's not one or just a handful of ministers in the church, but all of us are ministers. Help us to realize that you've given each and every one of us a sphere of influence. You've given each and every one of us a place where we can use the gifts, talents, and abilities that you have given us. We can take the truth of the gospel and we can live it out and we can share it with those in our world. God, I pray that you would help us to realize the importance that we have, the importance that there is in doing ministry together. Teach us from your word and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the struggle, as I've mentioned, that Moses faces in this passage is that he could not do ministry alone. Now, it's important for us to realize that we don't find Moses complaining here. Moses Moses isn't sitting over on a stool, uh, you know, singing gloom, despair, and agony on me, pobrecito de mi. Uh, We don't find Moses doing that. Moses has this big heart. Moses has a desire to minister to his people. He is fiercely determined And the people trusted him. They trusted him so much that they brought their disputes and their problems to him. But realistically, it was impossible for him to minister to hundreds of thousands of people on his own. Now, now, now here's what I want us to catch today, that that truth is not just an Old Testament truth. That principle is not just a principle that applied to the nation of Israel. It's not just a biblical truth, even though as we'll see in just a moment, it's found not only in the Old Testament, but it's found in the New Testament. For centuries, churches have depended upon their pastors to do the majority of the work of the ministry. Now, now don't get me wrong, all right? As pastors, we are supposed to work and we are supposed to work hard. I hear all the jokes on a regular basis. Pastors only work one day, one day a week. I wish I had pastor's hours. I could be off Monday to Saturday and come to work on Sunday. I hear all of those jokes, but I can tell you, watching our pastors, that our pastors work hard, and our pastors are available 24-7. But even with four pastors on our staff, and even with a great team of elders and a great team of deacons, we cannot do ministry alone. We are a congregation of hundreds and hundreds of people. We desperately need all of us to be involved in the work of the ministry. 
Carrie Newhoff, who's the pastor of Connexus Church, a growing congregation in Toronto, Canada, recently wrote, there is no way that a pastor can be available to everyone. He says this, writing to pastors, he said, you will wear yourself out trying to constantly be available for 200 people. There are many churches like ours that are much larger than 200 people. You see, for years, the church has made an unhealthy distinction between the clergy and the laity. We put pastors on a pedestal. We create this ministry hierarchy, and as a result, we have erroneously believed that ministry is the job of pastors. See, my friend Eric Welch out there, Eric and I have had these conversations. We've made this unhealthy distinction between the secular and the spiritual, as if it's my job to do the secular and it's the pastor's job to do the spiritual. As a result, we have erroneously believed that ministry is the job of pastors. And please understand, I'm not trying to get out of work today. I'm not trying to lighten the load necessarily of the men of God that God has given to us. I'm here to submit to you today, the simple fact is this, that's not the way God planned it. It's not the way ministry is described in the Bible. It's not the way that God desires for it to be in our congregation or any congregation. Now, I would pause and say, I'm so grateful. We have so many lay leaders that are involved in ministry in our church. We could not do our ministry were it not for the lay leaders in our congregation that step up and serve in so many different ways. That's what's being taught here in Exodus chapter 18. That's the way that God intends it. Let me read you a verse that the apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 and 12. Paul says, and he gave, speaking of the Lord, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers. The idea is that, that God gifts the church with those leaders. Notice he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It doesn't say that he gave the church those leaders so that they would do the work of the ministry. It says he gave them to the church to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. A phrase that you're going to hear us say frequently in the months and years to come very simply is this, every member is called to be a partner in ministry. We're not called to be spectators. We have been called to be participants. Every member is called to be a minister. Now, don't get scared. That doesn't mean that I'm going to look at you and say, okay, David, you're preaching on, you know, next Sunday, it's your turn. All of us have different gifts. All of us have different abilities. But all of us need to be participants in the great work of God in building his kingdom in the city of Hollywood and our community and through our our church. Every member is called to be a minister. I hope that's not falling on deaf ears. Would you say that with me today? Every member is called to be a minister. Okay, that was about 15% of you. Would the rest of you say it with me today? You might not be convinced, but I hope you are at the end of our service today. Every member is called to be a minister. As a matter of fact, let's change it just a little bit. I am called to be a minister. Now, don't say you were called to be a minister and point to me, all right? I want all of us to say today, I am called to be a minister. Say it with me again. I am called to be a minister. That's the truth that is conveyed here in this passage. Every member is called to be a minister. Now, before we flesh that truth out in today's passage, I want us to notice a few important principles that are found in the first part of the chapter. So put your finger in verse 13, and we're going to go back to the first part of the chapter and see a little bit of the foundation that is being laid so we understand exactly what is taking place. The first thing that I wrote in my notes that is in your notes today is this. God desires for his name and his fame to be known. God desires for his name and his fame to be known. Go back with me to verse 1 of chapter 18, and let's kind of put all of this in context. So Moses begins, and he says, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses 
and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought them out or how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So here's what's taking place. The news of Israel's departure from Egypt, what we've studied the last four months, the news of Israel's departure from Egypt and the victory over the Egyptian army was news that traveled fast throughout the then known world. I would remind you there was no CNN. There was no 24-hour cable news network. CNN did not exist. Fox did not exist. Whatever news source that you have, the internet did not exist. And although there was no 24-hour news source, major news traveled quickly in that day as well through the travelers, through the caravans, through the messengers that went throughout the then known world. And so even though Jethro was hundreds of miles away from Moses, Jethro was, was in Midian, which was in what is present day um, Arabia and that southern part of the peninsula, he, even though he was in Midian, he had heard all of the great things that God was doing. And I can imagine any traveler that passed that way, Jethro probably stopped him. He saw a caravan and he said, tell me, have you heard anything of the man Moses? Have you heard any news? What is happening in Egypt? What is happening with the Israelites? And as would be expected, he rejoiced every time he heard another story of how God miraculously rescued the Israelites and how God graciously used his son-in-law, Moses. Let me just pause for a second because there's a truth there that you and I can apply to our lives. And the truth very simply is this, God's work is never done in a vacuum. God desires for the world to hear of his great power. God desires for the world to know all the miraculous things that he has done, and I would submit all the miraculous things that he is still doing how that God saves, how that God rescues, how that God redeems his people. God desires for his name and his fame to be known. Here are a few verses, 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Psalm 105, 1 and 2, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Let me ask you, why are we sending a group to London, England today? Are they going to London, England so they, they, can, they can ride that big Ferris wheel, you know, that's right there on the Thames River? Are they going to London so they can try all of the food and they can learn the language there in England and come back and talk about the boot and all of those type of things? No. We're sending them so that they can share the glorious message that there's a God in heaven who loves the English people. And here's what God's done in our life, and God can do the same thing in your life. God desires to make his name and his fame known, and I would remind you that we are the proclaimers of God's fame. Think about that today. We are the proclaimers of God's fame. It is our responsibility to announce and spread his name and his fame to the world in which we live. Notice this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I love this verse. Peter says, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God did all of those things in our life, not so that we can take it, sit back and cross our arms and think, man, aren't we loved by God? But he did all of those things so that we might announce the excellencies of who he is to the world in which we live. That's what was taking place in Exodus chapter 18. Notice verse two as we continue reading. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home. For some reason, I'm gonna pause and kind of read as we go, but for some reason, Zipporah, Moses' wife, is, and their two sons are not with Moses at this time. Some of you read some books, some have speculated, ah, Moses and Zipporah must have gotten a divorce. Must have been some turmoil 
in that home. Some commentaries say that, but I don't believe that's the case. There's no indication of that in the biblical text. Most likely, Moses sent them back to Midian to protect them during the conflict with Pharaoh and the ultimate escaped from Egypt. So continue reading verse 3. So so Moses had sent Zipporah back with them, verse 3, along with her two sons. The name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of other, Eli, the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Notice the, the two names of the son. So Moses names his first son Gershom. And by the way, if you'll remember, that happened clear back in Exodus chapter 2 while he was in the land of Midian. So there, Zipporah and Moses' first son was born in Gershom because he was what? He was a stranger in a foreign land. He was in Midian. He wasn't with his people. And he basically was saying, man, I am not at home. But later on in life, he has a second son. And they named their second son Eliezer, which simply means my God is help. Now let me pause because we generally in this day and age don't name our children um, a name because of the significance of that name. When we named Justin, our oldest son Justin, we didn't look and say, what does the name Justin mean? Or what does the name Mark mean? What does that mean? Even though Mark would tell you, I think the name Mark means something. I, I don't remember what, do you know what it means? Or handsome warrior or something like that. <laughs> he would tell you, I think he's all messed up. Um, I always joke that my parents did it with intentionality, though, because the name Brian means strong one. And so I thought that my parents looked down through time and thought, boy, that's going to be a strong man, so let's name him Brian. That's not the case. We like names. And so we give names to our kids based upon how they sound, whether our son looks like a Brian or a Justin or our daughter looks like a Vicky. But in biblical times, it wasn't that way. Names meant something. And in Moses' family, those two names meant something. Here's what I, I concluded by that. Every time Moses looked at his sons, he was reminded of his journey of faith. Here's what I wrote down. Your family is a legacy of your faith. Think about that for a second. One way or another, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, your family is, is a legacy of your faith. Parents, you cannot, you must not separate your children's spiritual walk from your parental task. It is not the youth pastor's responsibility to teach your kids the Word of God. It is not the children's ministry director's responsibility, even though they're gonna do that, to teach your kids how they should live. It is our responsibility as parents the salvation and spiritual growth of your children, catch this, are your most important responsibilities. Let me say that again. The salvation and spiritual growth of your kids as parents are your most important responsibilities. It's more important than making sure there's food on the table. And please make sure of that. It's more important than, make sure that they had the, than making sure they have the most up-to-date clothes or that they get a good education or that they're successful in their sports program or that they have a good career. They are part of your spiritual legacy. We say that here, you know, I realize sometimes our kids struggle. I get that. I get that. But, but, but our goal as parents, wherever they are in their journey, our goal as parents is to realize that the most important thing that I'm trying to accomplish in this young man or this young lady's life is for them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Third thing that we draw from this chapter, I'm racing through these things, is this. Moses desired that his father-in-law become a believer in Yahweh. Now, now I would remind you, if you'll remember, we already studied this, so kind of think back. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was not a believer. Exodus chapter 2 tells us that he was a priest of Midian. 
I tried my best to figure out the last couple of days what was the religion of the Midianites, and there, quite frankly, is much ambiguity as to who the gods were that the Midianites worshipped. Some scholars say that they worshipped Baal Peor. Others said that they worshipped Ashtaroth. I don't think anybody knows for sure, but here's what we do know. They were not followers of Yahweh. They, they, they were not believers in the God of Israel. And so Moses had on his heart that his father-in-law become a believer. Notice in the text in verse 8 what is taking place. So, so Jethro brings Zipporah and the two young sons, and, and he's there with Moses. And so what does Moses do in verse 8? Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. I sat back and thought, wouldn't it have been cool to hear Moses tell that story? I mean, I know we're reading his words here in the text, but wouldn't it have been cool to sit, you know, around a campfire or with a cup of coffee in our hand and hear Moses say, man, let me tell you all the great things that God did with amazement, with enthusiasm, and probably with a tear in his eye. He shared with Jethro the miraculous things that God had done. I put this thought in my notes. Moses' testimony is a powerful illustration of how God protected and provided for his people. So, so how would Jethro respond? So, so, so here he's sitting around the fire with Moses. He's hearing that this priest of Midian, priest of another religion, hearing how the God of Israel had done all of these great things. How would Jethro respond? Notice verses 10, 11, and 12. He did three things that showed true, sincere faith on his part. Verse 10, Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. What's the first thing he did? He worshiped the Lord. Here's this non-believer that says, blessed be the God of your fathers. Blessed be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jethro worshiped the only true God. Now, notice in verse 12, it says, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all of the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, father-in-law before God. The second thing that he does is he sacrifices to the Lord. In the Old Testament, that idea of giving sacrifices was the legitimate demonstration of faith. Recognizing that I am sacrificing to the one true God, Jethro does that. And the third thing he does is he declares his faith. Notice verse 11. Notice what Jethro says. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. So here's Jethro, a pagan who hears all that Moses had done, and he places his faith in Yahweh, the God of Abraham. I sat back and, and I thought, how many of us have prayed for a family member who doesn't know the Lord for months or years or decades? Like Moses desired that his father-in-law become a believer. How many of us have desired that someone we know become a follower of Christ? Let me just ask you, how many of you today have prayed for a loved one for 10, 15, 20 years for a period of time? God, please change my husband. Please change my wife. Please change my kids. Please save my father or my mother or my father-in-law. Many of us have prayed that prayer. Listen, we see here in the text an illustration that what? That God answers those prayers. And that God miraculously reaches down. And maybe not immediately, maybe after a period of time, God rescues and God saves those individuals. Man, let me tell you a great story. Many of you are familiar with Marcia Hennessy in our congregation, one of our faithful godly ladies. Marcia has prayed for her husband, Mike, 
for 25 years. Mike, the nicest guy in the world, extremely funny, has one of the best sense of humors I- I've ever met. But Mike admittedly was not a believer. He was not a follower of Jesus Christ. Last weekend, Mike was in the hospital. He has cancer, been really struggling with cancer. A couple of our deacons, Wilson and Hinch, went by last Saturday, spent an hour and a half with Mike. Wilson came back and said, Brian, one of the funniest guys I've ever met. The guy sat there and told, told jokes the entire time. In the process of their conversation, Wilson and Hinch shared the gospel with Mike. Mike, do you want to give your life to Christ? Mike looked at Wilson and he said, well, if you want me to, I'll do it for you. And Hinch says, no, don't do it for me. It's got to emanate from your heart. It's got to come from your heart. So Hinch and and Wilson left that night with our hearts uh, a little heavy for Mike. Last Sunday, during the service, Brad was up preaching. Wilson gets a text message from Marcia. Wilson, come to the hospital. Mike's ready to give his life to Christ. Wait a second, wait a second, good news. So last Sunday, Wilson, Hinch, Jose was there, Darren and Jaquetzia was there. Mike gloriously realized that he needed Jesus in his life. He gave his heart to Jesus. What's that? Yeah, you can clap now, I'm sorry you can clap now. (laughs) Sorry about that. Yesterday morning at 5.30, Mike passed away. Mike went home to be with the Lord. I spoke with Marcia yesterday. The peace that Marcia has is unbelievable. For 25 years, she prayed for her husband, Mike. And last week, he gave his heart to Christ. She told me on the phone yesterday, she said, you know, Pastor Brian, I really even wondered, did he just do this for me? Did he just do it to pacify Wilson and Hinch? She said, but all Sunday afternoon, every time someone came in the hospital room, Mike would look at him and say, I just became a Christian. Are you a Christian? (laughs) There in the hospital, he was sharing his faith. I was with Sean Galligan over in our Spanish service this morning in Rosa, His wife is in Nicaragua now, visiting with her parents. Rosa has prayed for her mom and dad for years and years and years. Last night, Rosa was able to lead her dad to Christ. Listen, here's what we see in the past. Here's what I want you to catch. Moses desired for his father-in-law to become a believer, and he didn't give up. He was faithful, he prayed, he was a man of character, he was a man of integrity, and his father-in-law saw the power of God in Moses' life, and as a result, he gave his life to Christ. Don't stop praying, don't stop sharing your faith, don't quit encouraging those loved ones of yours who do not know the Lord. Believe that God is going to do something great in their life. You see, Jethro's response is a personal testimony of how God redeems people of every nation. He was not only burdened for the Israelites, but there was a priest, a Midian, a Midianite, who he was calling to himself. Now a follower, though, of God, Jethro sits back and observes how Moses is ministering to the Israelites. As we read in the beginning of our message, from morning till evening, Moses settled disputes, Moses dispensed advice, and Moses pastored the people. This went on day after day after day. And and here's Jethro sitting back, watching his son-in-law minister to the Israelites, and he sat back and he's like, boy, something's just not right here. And in verse 17, Jethro looks at Moses and he says, you can read it in your text, what you are doing is not good. Here's what Jethro is saying. He's not saying that, that the type of ministry he was doing was not good, but he was saying that the way that he was carrying out that ministry was not good. And so here's the advice that Jethro gives to Moses. He says this. He says, um, Moses, ministry must be shared. Ministry is not something that is done individually. It's not a one-man sport. Ministry is a team sport. 
And here in the passage, he actually gives some excellent leadership advice to Moses that applies not only in the spiritual world, but it applies in the secular world as well. If you're following along, here's a couple of things that I wrote down in my notes. The first is this, unshared ministry results in an unhealthy dependence upon the leader. Unshared ministry results in an unhealthy dependence on the minister. That's what was taking place in this story. Everyone depended upon whom? Who did they depend on? Moses. They had a problem. Who did they go to? Moses. If there was a dispute, who would they take it to? Moses. If husbands and wives couldn't get along, who resolved their argument? Moses. Moses sat there and from morning to night, he was what? He was the answer man. I mean, I mean, he was the guy that they brought all of their problems to. There were no other leaders. Moses was doing everything. And Jethro looks at him and he says, what you are doing is not good. It was creating an unhealthy dependence upon Moses. Think with me, church, let's apply that today in, in the day and age in which we live. Whenever a church or a ministry is dependent upon one person, that ministry is in trouble. Let me say that again. Whenever a church or a ministry depends upon one person, that ministry is in trouble because if the leader topples, what happens to the ministry? Listen, why? Maybe you sit back and, and question sometimes, man, why doesn't Pastor Brian preach every single Sunday? Maybe you sit back and think, I'm really glad Pastor Brian doesn't speak every single Sunday. I'm not sure what you think, but there is a method to our madness. Why? Because we believe in shared leadership here at Hollywood Community Church. It's a biblical principle. Unshared leadership, unshared ministry results in an unhealthy dependence upon a leader. Minister is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. It's to be shared. Here's the second conclusion that I drew. Unshared ministry results in the burnout of leaders. Unshared ministry results in the burnout of leaders. Here's what Jethro looks at Moses and he says this, you will certainly wear yourself out and you will wear your people out. The Hebrew word wear out there is an interesting word. It means to fade away. It means to kind of slowly crumble away. It has the idea of losing hearts. It has the idea of our English phrase, to be burned out. Here's a definition from a Christian website. I don't think I put it on the screen, a burnout. Burnout, especially in ministry, is the point at which a pastor or a church leader or a missionary gives up, unwilling to continue in the ministry. You might sit back and say, why? That never happens. These men, these women are called by God. Why would they give up? Burnout happens in ministry more than you and I realize. Here's a couple of statistics. Notice these statistics, hot off the press. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. We're losing pastors at an astronomical rate. 80% of pastors and 84% of their spouses feel unqualified or discouraged in their role as pastors. 50% of full-time workers are so discouraged in their ministry, they would leave their ministry if they could, if there was another option. What's the solution to that? The solution to that is shared ministry. That, that's what Jethro talks about in the passage. In, in verse 21, he looks at Moses and he said, Moses, what you're not doing is good. Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look for capable men. I want you to look for qualified individuals, people who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate bribes, individuals that you can entrust with responsibility. Here's what Moses is saying. I tried to simplify it. Here's what Moses is saying. Shared ministry results in the development of other leaders. Unshared ministry is unhealthy. Shared ministry is healthy. Unshared ministry results in burnout. 
Shared ministry results in everyone helping to carry the load. Jethro says two things about these leaders, and you already read it in the passage. The first thing he said is this, leaders are to be individuals with character and integrity. We just don't give responsibility to anybody. The first person that comes along, they must be honest individuals. They must have the right motives. They must be men and women of God. But he says this, leaders are to help carry the burden of ministry. The latter part of verse 22, he says this, and they will bear the burden with you. And I I am here at Hollywood Community Church, let me pause and say this. I am so thankful for the elders that God has given to us. I am so thankful for the pastors that God has given to us. I am so thankful for the deacons, the deacon couples that God has given to us. You all do a phenomenal job in helping us carry the load. But ministry is not just the job. Yeah, let's give them a hand. I do that, please. (laughs) Ministry is not just the job of pastors, elders, and deacons. Ministry is a team sport. So, So I put at the bottom of your outline today, at HCC, we desire for every member to be a minister. Actually, I was talking with a, with a pastor from South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and he looked at me and said, Brian, we don't use the term members anymore. I said, oh, really? Why don't you use the term members? He said, members has the idea of a social club. Where you're a member, you join, and you get all the benefits of the club. He said, Brian, by the way, that's not even a New Testament word. I said, what word do you use? He said, partners. He said, that's a New Testament word. We're all partners in ministry. So at HCC, we desire for every single one of our partners to be involved in ministry. So here's a question, very personal. Don't raise your hand, don't respond out loud. Answer the question yourself. What are you doing to help carry the load? What are you doing to help carry the load? Man, church, there is so much to do in the city of Hollywood. I meet with fellow pastors around Hollywood on a regular basis. There is so much to do, and there is so little that we are doing. Well, you say, Brian, what can I do? Hey, hey, can I give you a couple of things that you can do? All right? Just want to kind of stir your interest just a little bit. At HCC, we're looking for men and women who know God's Word enough. Don't have to be, you know, a master's degree in Bible but you know God's word enough to stand up and help teach God's word, to lead life group. We are, we are desperately seeking for life group leaders. And we have people that just aren't so, we have people here that are qualified to do that, but they're not doing that. I met with a leader from InterVarsity the other day in a pastor's meeting and he wrote me a note. They have a, they have a weekly Bible study down at Young Circle with the homeless. He said, Brian, we're desperately looking for people that'll come with us on Monday night and help to minister to these homeless people in Young Circle. It's not a service. We just kind of sit around in a group and minister to one another, and they're hungry for God's word, and I don't have enough people to minister to them. There are nursing homes in our community that are begging for people to come and minister to their clients. We have nursing homes call us. Howard and Jerry know this. We have nursing homes ask us, do you have somebody that'll come and minister to our people? We need somebody who'll say, I'll do that. I'll minister to them. We're always looking for children's workers in our ministry. We're not, Joanne, we're always in need of children's workers. We're forming a local missions team to help with local missions project. We have a global missions team. We wanna form a local missions team Do you know that we have widows and single moms in our community that want to come to our church, but they don't have a way here? They need somebody to bring them. Would you be willing to do that? We're asking God for mentors for Hollywood Christian School, for our students. Many of our students come from broken homes. They come from homes that have no dad or no spiritual representation, and we are desperately looking for men and women who will say, I can do that. I can mentor a student. 
Listen, here's what Jethro shares with Moses, what Paul shared with the church of Ephesus, and what God wants us to know. Ministry is to be shared. Will you help us carry the load? Will you help us minister to our community and our church family at Hollywood Community Church? Together, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. Thanks, Steve. By the way, it's good to see Steve Gillis here today. Together, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. Let, let me challenge you today. God wants to use you. You might sit back and say, oh man, Brian, I don't know what, what talents I have. I'm not a public speaker. Listen, there are so many things that need to be done. God wants to use you. We say often, the greatest ability is availability. It's just sitting back saying, okay, God, here I am. Use me. I'm not the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want you to come up to me today and say, okay, Brian, put me where you want me to serve. I want you to have a burden. I want the Holy Spirit of God to recruit you. I don't want to recruit you. I want the Holy Spirit to recruit you. But the simple truth is this, we're doing some miraculous things through our ministry, but we are just beginning to scratch the surface. And if all of us will lock arms and do our part, there's no limit to what God can do through us. Let's be participants together. Let's make a difference in Hollywood for Jesus Christ.